All right, we should get going. So hi, everyone, again. Um, some of you may have met uh, Dr. Monahan last night um, at the winery. Um, today, he's going to talk to you um, on climate and infectious disease. Andy works at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder um, in the Climate and Health Program there in the Research Applications Laboratory. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And he's going to do a similar kind of talk to what a lot of the um, facilitators have been doing this week for you. So let's have, we'll have good discussion again, hopefully. I was kind of wondering what your backgrounds are. Science. 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 Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what other stuff do you have? Well, science. Science. Okay. Any other colleges? Okay. Communications. All right. <laughs> Psychology. Psychology. <laughs> the million system heads of change. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so um, the uh, instruction was talking a little bit about my uh, career path um, and getting to give a few slides on work, which I don't have the whole bunch of these slides. I think you have plenty of time for kind of this general discussion of what you want to chat about. Um, so, uh, as Jenny mentioned, I'm at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. Um, ICAR is an interesting kind of hybrid type of place. It's, it's an NSF funded, um, it's federal funded research and development center from NSF. Um, about half of our budget comes from NSF and the other half comes from grants. Uh, I work in a division that's pretty much, it's about 90% grant funds. Most of my salary comes from grants. Um, we kind of make our, what we um, are managed by a consortium of university members, all the universities that have PhD granting, um, or have degree granting abstract science programs um, in the US and some in Canada, kind of sit on a managing body for and can kind of guide us. So our uh, core mission is to serve the university community. Our was originally kind of conceived to, when back in the 50s and 60s, when a lot of the, the critical research to start developing numerical weather prediction capabilities come about. Um, it was realized by the university community that a central resource was needed to do some of the very expensive types of projects that go on in first day resources, like this aircraft management model development, that type of thing. So today we have um, a couple of aircraft that serve the community um, and two, two models that have come out of NCAR. Um, one of the models that Derek just, um, of, of the kind of ensemble models that Derek just presented, one of them comes out of our organization. It's called System model. Um, so it's one of the climate models that's involved in doing the IPCC projections. And then uh, that has about a thousand users globally. And then the weather research and forecasting model is what we call a limited area model. And that's kind of a model that you plunk down into um, a global model, whether it be a climate model or uh, a global weather prediction model. And it can kind of downscale results. And so we use that for weather prediction mainly, um, although we also use it for climate prediction and downscale. Um, it has 30,000 plus users worldwide, so it's a much larger user base than, than the climate model used by military, civilian, uh, research community. Uh, chances are uh, the weather forecasts you see on the news at night are being guided in part by predictions from that model. It's used by the um, NOAA for their one or two of their high resolution kind of now cast and forecast predictions. So, so the point is the model, so, so we do some model development, um, quite a bit of um, instrumentation, uh, aircraft um, research, and then I work in an applied laboratory, so most of what we do is why we have wind energy uh, or renewable energy, um, hydrometeorological axle cloud seeding, and other things. Um, and I work social scientists, I'm a modeler within, within that group, and um, I do some 
specifically work on finding key health problems. Um, my path to this was sort of through this. Um, my research background, I, I went to the University of Hawaii for Fairfax uh, and got a degree in civil engineering there. I was doing um, some work for uh, kind of engineering type of work during and after college and realized that it wasn't really for me. And I uh, took a job as a technician the University of Alaska Water and Environmental Research Center. So it was a group that does um, hydrologic research and modeling in um, kind of circumpolar, um, circumpolar Arctic, but particularly um, Arctic and Western Alaska. Uh, they have a network of hydrologic and weather monitoring stations. So they can monitor those as well. So it was really fun job. Um, that got me interested in. to pursue that type of a career and then got a PhD um, in civil engineering and also took that degree. And so I uh, took my um, GRE and um, applied to um, Ohio State University's atmospheric science program. And the reason for applying there is they have a, um, a research center called the Burke Polar Research Center. It's um, kind of a large interdisciplinary polar research center. Uh, so I went there, and um, most of the work there, or all of the work that I did there, was, was Antarctic based. So looking at my PhD work was looking at um, recent uh, snowfall and temperature changes by each side of the Arctic in the last half century in Antarctica. It was, it was a really um, interesting place to, to do research. Uh, there, you know, it's, it's one and a half times the size of the United States. There are a few, about 12 uh, long term weather. Biomonitoring stations mainly around the coast and then one kind of more in the South Pole. So we have very little data to kind of constrain or climate change um, knowledge. The, the research done there is kind of about putting together a lot of scraps of data from ice cores and satellites to do in situ observations. There are, are the uh, funding for polar research is very limited. Uh, NSF is basically the main uh, funding body for that. NASA funds a little bit as well. But for the most part, the opportunities are limited. And so um, when I got my PhD, which was in uh, 2007, there just wasn't a lot available to continue to do with that, even though I really enjoyed that. Uh, while I was at Ohio State, I had uh, a modeling expertise surrounding these models that I described uh, in this talk. Um, that's a more transferable skill. And so I um, had applied for several postdocs at NCAR. NCAR is kind of, if you're a meteorologist, there's a pretty good chance you're going to end up there for at least a part of your career. It's, it's um, kind of a central place in the, in the meteorological community. And, uh, so I applied for some postdocs there and got the job. And I applied for an associate scientist basically working for someone running model um, model simulations, which are what this little animation to them. Um, this is actually funded by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. They wanted a 20-year high-resolution global reanalysis. Uh, reanalysis where you go back and run past, uh, basically rerun climate over the past 10, 20, 30 years in order to kind of learn, learn a little bit about the past. They wanted it so that they could transported dispersion models, which are another class of models that are used to look at the flow of chemical or maybe chemical or biological agents in the air to do these colored polar rays of light type of thing. So, so we developed that and then that, that lasted a few years. So then I met an anthropologist who worked at NCAR and uh, we still work together very closely. She's a medical anthropologist um, and she got hired on to start developing web uh, weather climate health program at NCAR. And so we started collaborating on projects and kind of built up a little program over time in that. And that's kind of where we are today. I've been at NCAR since 2000, end of 2007. And this has been what I've spent most of my time on. Um, our program is soft money funded, so we work on grants from 
C, NIH, uh, some funding from the Gates Foundation uh, right now, NASA, um, Google.org has a little bit of funding from them. Um, Defense Threat Reduction Agency funds some, some um, disease modeling type of type stuff. So all sorts of kind of different funding tools that we apply for uh, through this through this program. Um, we work on in the United States, Lyme disease is the largest vector one disease in terms of incidence, about 30,000 cases a year reported. Um, West Nile virus is the largest mosquito borne um, virus transmitted in the US. Number of cases is probably is not well constrained because it's only so bad in a small percentage of the population. But that was introduced in Chris in 1999. So we've been doing some work at CDC trying to uh, develop a early warning system. Can you speak to the Lyme disease research? The Lyme disease research has been more aimed at looking at seasonality in the Lyme disease and how that might be used in the future. Um, so the problems we would ask to address are kind of interesting. They're all over the board, but I can say if you to categorize them, there's kind of three categories. One of the categories is more or less basic research, kind of trying to understand the disease ecology, um, how meteorology affects it, um, and that can in turn maybe inform how to intervene to break the cycle of um, virus transmission or some other aspect of the disease. Um, another, a second category would be early warning or decision support. Tools and we're increasingly kind of being asked about that for health departments and like you say, local levels. And at the federal level, there's been a little bit of interest in this, or quite a bit of interest in this as well. And some of the viruses that we haven't seen previously in those are being identified as risk score. Um, and then the, the third category would be climate change impacts, so trying to address questions about how climate change will impact um, the disease system. That's a very challenging problem to get at. Not because we don't have the climate objections, that's the easy part, but the hard part is actually socioeconomic um, and human behavioral factors that are also first order impacts on the sort of health outcomes that we just can't control the climate issues. When we're talking about predicting diseases in the future, what we're really talking about is looking at increased habitat suitability, all else equal. Um, but that doesn't necessarily translate into increased risk for disease transmission for human disease in the future. Human plague is about 90% of cases are in East Africa. The work we do is in, uh, ironically, the West Nile region of Uganda. Um, and uh, that's a, uh, I should mention, Lyme disease is, trans is the, the causal agent of Lyme disease. Borrelia burgdorferi is a bacterium that's transmitted by ticks. The weather linkage with all of these is typically vector populations, vector breeding biologies that transmits by bacterium or mites um, or other pathogen. Their populations fluctuate with the weather. Um, so you, you have some, you can use neurological fields to kind of look at seasonal fluctuations and the incidence of uh, <coughs> West Nile virus is one of the Culex mosquitoes, which are all over the United States. Um, human plague is uh, fleas. Uh, they travel on rats, so there's kind of two different vectors involved with that. There's the, the actual vector itself, which would have been the rat hosts, also their population dynamics also are determined by weather and crop patterns. Um, meningitis is tied to the Ismailian Sahelian region. Tied to, um, it's tied to the dry and hot season, and actually the transmission of that is not problem. It's, it's not known whether it's occurring, whether um, this is bacterial meningitis, whether the bacteria that cause meningitis and bacterial meningitis is kind of local and it just flares up during the, the dry, hot season and people's mucosa dry out and they more susceptible, or whether it's actually transported from elsewhere during the dry season to a large dust storm. So it's kind of an interesting one. But we, regardless of the cause, we're actually able to model it um, fairly accurately because it's tied with dry and hot conditions. And the only place that we can 
um, extreme heat vulnerability. Stuff this week. I'm sure that's one that as meteorologists we uh, study uh, quite a bit. And Jenny is uh, has her expertise much more than I uh, some work in that. And then uh, the main one that I work on is um, a mosquito that is Aedes aegypti, which is an interesting mosquito that is a human commensal. So instead of breeding in marshes and swamps. Mosquito actually breeds in containers like this or coughs stuff or um, bottle caps, tarps, planters. Um, it breeds in people's backyards. It prefers, the females uh, prefer to take human blood because the females have a higher chance of something else filtering through that blood because they're not exposed to the things. So they, they, um, but they, they, this, this mosquito literally has evolved to, to depend on humans. And so it's very difficult to. For that reason, because it's in people's backyards, so spraying with foggers in the streets, it's on the marshes, and they have to uh, do this. And this mosquito transmits dengue, chikungunya, Zika, uh, yellow fever. Um, so it's uh, kind of a growing threat, although they're seeking to grow threats in the Americas and a wide variety of reasons. I think I'll talk for 10 more minutes and then I have a half hour. Okay. So I was going to talk a little bit about the mosquito itself just to give you some background of one of the these kind of interesting vectors that we look at, but also some of the some of the um, complexities of, of looking at climate health issues. Climate is often not the first order issue that we would consider very important. So we have technical approaches. Um, I also wanted to just mention we have a we have a postdoc report in this. Um, funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Infant Prevention. We bring in two, two postdocs every two years. Um, one of them works at the National Centers for Environment with the National Centers for Environmental Health, which is based in Atlanta. So environmental health is one of the air quality and extreme heat research. The other works with the Division of Microbial Diseases, which works with all those other kinds of organism transmitted uh, viruses or pathogens that I that I mentioned. Uh, they split their time, so they spend a year in the farm and a year in the SEC at these kind of cross training with scientists in various aspects of human health systems, climate sensitive human health systems. And then we have a busy program uh, history effort as well, with visitors um, like Jenny or Mike or um, one of the other students in the last two years that um, bring in researchers from the Aedes aegypti, as I mentioned, it's a, a transmitter of this black, um, several um, important viruses. Uh, it lives in close association with humans, breeds in containers. Um, it, the interesting thing is that it eats during the daytime. So the malaria mosquito, Anopheles mosquito, eats during the nighttime. So when you do that mutation, you manage to do that, it's the distribution of that has made its foundation in the last few years successfully. Knocking down, um, kind of reducing cases of. That does wouldn't be as effective for these viruses because this mosquito is really not a close relative of the ones out there. Uh, this is the approximate global range of the mosquitoes. So the only thing I want to point out here is that you can see that it exists in the tropics and subtropics. So there's definitely the climatic envelope that, that constrains this mosquito uh, warm, humid, wet conditions of what it prefers. Um, this is a map that was published last week, and uh, I didn't present this yesterday, so it's a lot easier to write. But uh, this gives you an idea of the county level reported distribution in the United States. And uh, you can see that, that uh, it's spotty. That's um, more a remnant of surveillance than anything else. So I talked to uh, Steve Presley, who's, who's uh, our faculty member here at Texas, uh, Texas Tech yesterday. He said that there are 63 counties in Texas that do no surveillance of this mosquito. So we're actually getting ready to go out and, and do trapping um, in every county in Texas to actually try to update this, this map. But you can see that uh, Lubbock County has um, 80 significant units. It's um, 
this is because of the latency of 50 years now, the thickness of it's also transferable viruses. It's a more rural mosquito that doesn't particularly prefer it in white human food, so it's not quite as effective on uh, bacteria and fungi um, these viruses. Um, so the impacts on uh, uh, just I think this um, might be self-evident from what I've mentioned already, but um, weather impacts on ADC chippy temperature affects the rates of development. Um, once they're developed, uh, it affects their survival in each life stage. Uh, it affects their feeding habits, how quickly they feed, how vigorously they feed. Uh, it also affects virus incubation. So these mosquitoes can't immediately transmit a virus once they get a virus. Uh, and the way that they get viruses is from people. So they're not typically born with a with a virus. They have to bite a human who's in the U.S. would have traveled from an area where the virus exists. They bite that human. They take, uh, in the case of dengue, about seven to fourteen days of um, temperature for the virus to work its way from the salivary gland, from the mid gut up to the salivary gland, and also replicate. And then they can transmit it when they're ready to eat again. Typically, they won't really eat again until the females have laid their, their batch of eggs and they're ready to take another one from their, their batch of eggs. So there's a lot that has to happen for, uh, for that, but the temperature plays a role in a number of different aspects of the life cycle. And on these mosquitoes, how, how important are bats and swallows to control? Um, or, I mean, bats obviously like you, but they just don't fly like that. Yeah. So what, what kind of control is there going in the world today? Does that mean you know much? Uh, there's not much that I know of um, from a natural um, habitat standpoint that controls them. Uh, there's a, one of the control methods is PTIs. Natural lab control mechanisms. It's possible that there are, it's just my lack of. Well, I'm not going to mention a lot of mosquitoes and bats that are yeah. you know, for the swallows. The other question is what, what's the normal viral titer in a person in order for the mosquito to be ubiquitous? That's actually a question that is not well understood. Um, rainfall um, plays an important role. So if you look at the, this little jar here, it shows the life cycle. So it also still will lay eggs in a container, an artificial container, um, either above the water line or if the container is deep, deep, they'll be laid there. They prefer darker containers because it's more quiet to lay the stage and they start to feel hot to see the different appearance. Um, when it rains or when someone manually fills a container, it's important that the humans can actually initiate the cycle and irrigate it. Similarity is back to this. Um, when, that, when those eggs become submerged in the water, you get the rainfall and they're brilliant. They'll hatch, the pink, they'll hatch um, soon after the temperature. They go through several larval stages. People get it and they can take it off. So, so um, water plays an important part. The rate of this whole cycle is temperature dependent. It can take between a week down to the thick end um, up to three weeks or more. So it's uh, kind of the optimal temperatures would be 25 to 32 degrees Celsius for each. Um, they prefer to have very constant temperatures rather than large fluctuations in temperature, just like John was talking about. So something similar, I think, would be true for uh, microbes. Humidity is something we don't know much about, but we're studying in uh, the other parts of the world, just in our desert right now. These mosquitoes have really rapidly expanded over the last decade or so in Arizona and Southern California. And um, Arizona in particular is kind of an interesting one because they have short monsoon season, but it's well, um, very arid for most of the year. They have huge numbers of this mosquito in Phoenix. Uh, dengue fever. Um, so, just give a quick uh, three viruses dengue fever. Dengue hemorrhagic fever are caused by several different uh, strains of viruses transmitted by these mosquitoes. Typically, it's kind of fever like symptoms. One of the key indicators of dengue is joint and muscle pain. It's called breakthrough fever as well. Um, there are about 400 million people who have the virus worldwide annually, so compared to the dengue, which is about all the virus. 
crisis as the crisis increases by far the largest one in terms of incidents. Um, until recently, there was no flu vaccine available. Uh, there is a new vaccine being tested in Mexico. Uh, actually, it was recently approved in Mexico. It's already been tested. It is not approved. So the, that, that's important because the way you, you know, mitigate these things is you use different kinds of control elements is, uh, or human avoidance. So education outreach plays a very important role in that mitigating this uh, in getting these, these mosquito populations and virus transmission. Uh, we've seen an increasing number of severe cases in the Americas. Get into details on that if you're really interested in the details of the data. Uh, chikungunya was not in the Americas until 2014. It swept through the Caribbean, uh, over a million locally acquired cases after it was introduced. We now have it, um, had local transmission in Florida in 2014. Um, chikungunya is um, a little bit more, um, they only 25% of people are symptomatic, so 75% of people don't even know how the virus really entered. Uh, if they have it, chikungunya is kind of the opposite. 75% of the people who get it actually have symptoms, so it's much more, um, has a bigger impact in terms of symptoms on the population, but it also has had some chronic impacts in terms of arthritis um, and other um, issues that come with that. Zika, um, I'm sure you've all seen this in Phoenix. It was not in the Americas until its introduction into Brazil in early 2015. Basically, last year um, in Brazil, now we're getting like estimating between 500,000 and 1.5 million cases. Uh, it's probably severely underreported because the, the symptoms that you have are actually quite mild. Um, so, most people are going to have a flu and not have to worry about it. The reason that there's so much concern is because it's been linked to microcephaly. Newborns, so birth defects, um, and also to neonatal syndrome, which is a neurological disorder that can also cause. Uh, it's transmitted primarily by mosquitoes, but can also be transmitted sexually, which is um, an interesting um, aspect of other viruses. Actually, not necessarily the male virus, but the male sexual The so that's kind of the, the Zika risk. I think I just wanted to have. This slide in here really quickly. In order to get a virus to emerge, it's not as simple as you would think. You have to have um, several kind of ingredients. You need to have the underlying environmental conditions, the suitability for the mosquito and for virus replication. So you need a warmer or cooler area. Um, you need to have a mosquito that's not visible to the house. So the mosquito has expanded and proliferated to control the transportation networks and the way So it is being, you think it is being reintroduced to just about populated area in the world on a regular basis. So whether or not it gets a foothold depends on whether these other things are in the world, not the virus, but whether there are humans there um, that, that can support the populations of other cavity products. Um, humans are a prerequisite uh, for virus transmission in particular um, high enough densities. So these viruses are typically urban uh, urban viruses uh, that we're talking about. So you see it cities on different sites. Uh, and that basically has to do with putting enough humans to increase the probability that virus transmission will allow uh, the virus to amplify and disappear in human populations. The virus, um, like the mosquito, is constantly being introduced to areas and it will travel to different areas. Um, and it'll, uh, in terms of non-endemic areas, if there are non endemic Bringing virus can help people with that and have contact tracing and so forth. It's kind of a local virus transmission cycle. So, last slide I have is this one. This is kind of tying things together. This is a paper published from a couple months ago. It was looking, trying to look at kind of Zika risk in the United States from a, um, a more qualitative perspective, but putting some of these ingredients together. Um, I don't know if you can see. See this pink line here? These are historical areas where we have observed the antigen mosquitoes based on kind of like that CDC county level map, but going back a little bit further, we have more observations and 
So historical range of habitat suitability, where we've seen it, has been here. Um, this gray line is Aegis albopictus. That's kind of the less efficient vector. It's a little harder to pull their temperatures, so they live a little bit further north in the U.S. Um, these red areas that are in South Texas and South Florida are where we've seen previous local virus transmission of dengue and chikungunya to other viruses transmitted by chikungunya. So it's kind of making the point that history um, repeats itself, and, and Zika is anything like these other viruses that we think it is, then we might expect to see emergence of those particular areas. The circles show two things. The size of the circle is the amounts of travelers coming in from Zika endemic countries in the Americas. So for example, in Miami, we have about a million people per month coming in from Zika endemic areas. So there's, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a proxy of the probability of virus sense production. Um, we don't know how many people are infected, but the more people coming from those places, the more you, you know, higher probability of being infected. And then the top and bottom is um, some modeling work that we did specifically for this paper. We modeled the daily Populations of these mosquitoes for the previous 10 years, and then we aggregated them from one way out to these these 50 cities. Um, and this is model based results, so it doesn't represent reality. So, for example, we wanted to look in areas northward of where we know the existing lineages just to see if there's habitat suitability from a model perspective. And these are meteorologically driven models of the life cycle of the mosquitoes. So, for example, in Oklahoma City, we don't presently have any sensitivity um, that I know of. But um, we do have um, climatic suitability during right part of the year. The top of the circle is the January suitability, and the bottom of the circle is the July suitability. So, for example, if you look at these more northern areas, you just see gray areas. Basically, there's no Aedes, no potential for any Zipi to survive there in January because it's too cold. Um, and then the, the bottoms are the mid July summertime conditions. You can see that most of the cities, not all of them, you have at least some habitat suitability in the summer. So that's consistent with what we've seen in the past. We've had, um, even though Aedes aegypti doesn't live in uh, Philly or New York today, it is in Washington. Um, even though it's not in Philly or New York today, there were uh, first reported dengue outbreaks in the state in 1783 in Philadelphia. The mosquitoes have been here for hundreds of years. It's actually contracted the plant somewhat uh, because of the improved living conditions. So the introduction of plant water was a huge one. Uh, in terms of reducing changes in salary patterns back a couple hundred years ago, also um, changed trade patterns and, um, and uh, also had an effect on changing the behavior of the species. Why are the angels flying small models? Is that a good question? Yeah, um, this particular model, um, the, the, these, these are process based models, they run over daily time steps. You, Put um, max on the minimum daily temperature and dissipation that you do. However, you also uh, we're modeling it from the computer level, so you have to make assumptions about the numbers of containers that are in people's yards. Um, you have to make assumptions about water availability. So, for the most part, populations of this um, mosquito rise and fall with rainfall. So, for example, in the southwest, you see the, the populations will peak during the monsoon season, and they'll basically be in the middle of during the July season. However, you can, um, we also have a certain percentage of containers that have been in the earth mass and equals beryllids, which are those kind of plants that can hold water in them, um, those types of things. Those are great habitats in an area like Phoenix, where you have, you have really nice um, springtime cold temperatures, not too hot. It's good from a temperature perspective, but it's the dry season, which you can still get mosquitoes because there are there's manual homing plants. So that's a, a lot like a huge uncertainty in that. You don't know what people are building in their backyard. You really don't know what those plants are in people's backyards. So I think the interesting thing about these models is that they're pretty good at capturing meteorological aspects, how meteorology impacts the mosquitoes. And we know quite a bit about that from, from lab and field based studies, but what we don't know are kind of where this mosquito is living, human behavior as it continues to fill in these containers and whatnot. So, the uncertainty is more driven by um, the different folks' behavioral demographic factors, socioeconomic factors, which is basically just typically found in poorer areas uh, where you may have, uh, um, even in the US, you know, some of these buildings that may have um, a lot of water 
bathroom that you don't have, all the services that you might have for some kitchen, water, provision, uh, those are areas where the city sees a lot of storage. And that, that's really all I have. So uh, I'm sure there's plenty of time for questions about this and then just kind of career discussion. Oh, so I was just going to say, given that some areas in states like Texas, for example, is getting meter, sub meter, you know, aerial photography, aerial imagery for the whole state, do you think that there is? Uh, doing an analysis of that imagery for seeing what kinds of, you know, if there are structures, because that resolution can start seeing whether people have structures in the area, in their backyard. Is that yeah. more water? Do you think that be something that would help? Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a really good point. So we had a project uh, three years ago where it was quick for everything, which is mm -hmm. uh, half meter, um, pretty one of the higher res that you can get straight from space for. This, and um, we, we got it over uh, an area in Mexico where we have dang trees, where we have some of the longer term program. And currently, we're going for 300 homes and doing 400 per acre in each of those yards. And then the idea was to use the imagery to basically calibrate the imagery to the containers that we found and then use, um, use the imagery to, to then create an algorithm to estimate what was in. Um, yards, you know, areas where we were putting the trees where we were doing those. We were marginally successful with that. The, um, I think it probably could be a reasonable job to be done with that, but we didn't quite crack the problem. And part of it is because probably 80% of the containers you can't see from space because they're under patios or vegetation. And so we had kind of had the um, the issue of not being able to see containers in space, so you have to use other proxies like roof, you know, types of roofs and the amount of vegetation, building, uh, other building elements. And do you think that maybe something like LIDAR, which can penetrate vegetation, would be able to maybe look under the canopy to see structures or something like that? Do you think that would be a better method of trying to do this analysis than just looking at a satellite image? Yeah, it could potentially be. I think it's an area that. Yeah, um, as a matter of fact, we, we do do some of that um, type of work. Um, I didn't really have time today to get into the details of these models. The particular models that we use to create the circles on this map, basically, those are mosquito life cycle models. They can, but they're basically simulating the abundance of female aphids and chicken that go through these different models. Those can then be plugged into the virus transmission model in that little text. So, yes, are you familiar with the kind of epidemiology? Anyways, it can, they can be plugged into epidemiological models. Um, and if we know enough about virus transmission, which we do know quite a bit about dengue, we don't know too much about Zika, so a lot of people work to kind of research and scramble and figure out things like what is the incubation period for this mosquito, uh, those types of things. But, but all that to say, um, we can simulate dengue pretty simple. Um, we had a study in San Juan that we published a couple of years ago doing that. So, we, the problem that we run into is that we can share the real surveillance data in addition to kind of the calibrating the methodology of these models. So we can make projections, but the problem we have is that there are a lot of areas where it is weird surveillance, so it can be some skill that you might be able to get by with that. You know, in Mexico, you can get state level monthly trigger cases. It doesn't help you a whole lot to know what happens in an area the size of West Texas. You know, you want to be able to. To inform public health decisions, you can see vector control decision <clears throat> at least city scale in terms of vector control in neighborhood scale. So we, I think you can see where I'm going with that. But we just don't have great surveillance. But we do. Puerto Rico is uh, where CDC scan branches, and it's where we have um, uh, endemic transmission and regular transmission in the same area. So we have a good vector control decision, especially in San Juan, where I've tested on our own simulator. 
you know, in the instance there. You can do a reasonable job, but it's a moving target. You know, the factors that are major influences in one year are not necessarily major influences in the next year. So these models, there are, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of kind of parameters you have to estimate to get a guess. And your, your parameter settings are going to be different from one year to one year to the next. And that's a really difficult thing. So you can use, I, I saw that you were learning about model ensembles. That's exactly what we're going to use for one of our 10,000 ensembles as members. So something like that if you pick a big group of new member or something like that. Or you have some data to validate on like 10,000 members and then kind of pick those best 100 that simulate that historical period and try to use those best 100 to move forward and predict. There are now a set of um, seasonal daily climate projections, a project called P. Um, that we're um, just starting to use to, to do some seasonal, what look like one to three months in advance. We're just starting to test that. The, um, we, we need daily tech data in order to run these models, and typically seasonal climate projections have only been available to the public at monthly timescales, so now we have um, these daily timescale seasonal projections that apparently we can do NASA's sport group, spot group is pretty well. Uh, so we're going to look at using those to actually do predictions. Um, so I work in Peak One in um, Mexico, on the US and the Mexico side. And I've been noticing a lot that it's all over both millennials. There's uh, a really large difference between like below the Mexico. And the other thing that's really curious is there's so much, and we know this obviously, but I think it's hard to quantify, there's a lot of um, mobile populations that daily move across the US Mexico border. And the socioeconomic conditions in Mexico and these areas that are really industrial are a lot worse than they are in the US. And so, in terms of containers and different parts of our state that can speed up some of these repairs, like, um, I can imagine there's a lot of um, disease that can be easily transmitted to these, um, to these mobile populations. And a lot of them being undocumented, et cetera, like that. There's no way to use a large database to adequately quantify for that. And so I see that's sort of a gap in some ways. And I'm wondering how that's being addressed. Because I, I work also with the Office of Border Health in Mexico. Yeah. And that's a concern of those states because often they just have to actually quantify these populations that are kind of moving um, under the radar. And that also, there's, it's really hard to get information certain areas and so trying to figure out ways that um, we can work more bilaterally and also we can uncover these pockets that are that aren't visible. Yeah, that's a good question. There are your your one question I think was covering these gaps being addressed. Yeah. You know, I think um, they're not being addressed for the most some some of the more detailed aspects, you know, I don't think are being addressed um, probably as adequately as they could. I, I probably know less about this than you of some of the on the ground uh, activities that are going on. Um, the, um, well, I, some of the research that's been done has been, you've probably read this research on the kind of Brownsville, Matamoros um, after Hurricane, uh, what was that? This big dengue outbreak in, in Brownsville back in 2007, 2006. Um, anyways, um, CDC went down and did an outbreak investigation. The ser they looked at serial prevalence, which is something that is not often done, but you can basically find dengue antibodies in, um, in blood long after dengue was transmitted. The serial blood prevalence of dengue on the US side was in the 30, more than 30%. On the, um, on the Matamoros side, it was in the 70s. So there was high serial prevalence, um, high number of people who had contracted the dengue virus on both sides. Um, that type of, of surveillance is probably something that um, would be very useful for, for better understanding dengue. Since I think that dengue is probably greatly underreported along the US-Mexico border um, just because it's hard to, to um, surveil in, in these areas and, and to, uh, to test people. So um, I think to answer your question, um, 
there are a lot of guests that are not being addressed in the public meeting on this. I don't know how that's being Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the, um, the work we did in Houston, um, sorry, I didn't talk about this. This is, um, we had a project recently. So it's nice to work in a group of social scientists. They do a lot of um, survey work. So much of what we do in this business ENR is we'll, we'll go in and we'll collect mosquitoes and find that they got them on the ground. But we also do household surveys, knowledge attitudes, practices, what you kind of, you know, Human behavior uh, and how that modulates disease risk. So we're trying to look at both the physical system but also this human factor in the behavior and numbers transmission. Um, we will typically um, do stakeholder workshops at the meetings. Uh, a couple of them, usually one during a project, one after it. Um, try to engage, um, you know, at the at the kind of local to state government level. Uh, engage those decision makers in what they're doing. And I'll tell you also, we have um, had good good results working with students in schools, high school level, college level, because they're really enthusiastic and energetic, but also they're, they're communicating and working with that with their families. Uh, it's a good way to kind of get the message out about what's for why this is. Um, in Houston, we had a project recently that was looking at this group of people, basically we're modeling um, mortality in at the neighborhood level across the city as a function of not only extreme heat, um, which varies across the city based on the built environment, but also um, as a function of demographics, socioeconomic issues, air conditioning access, um, social connectivity, like those types of things. Um, so for that, we had um, we worked with the Public Health Department for the city of Houston, and then they helped us set up a kind of a majority member stakeholder workshop to look at that. And then that led to the development of, of a GIS tool that they could, they kind of co provided input on that they could use to identify at risk areas within the city and then also look at resources available like community centers and public transportation routes that could, could reduce risk for, for populations. So, Kind of what they had wanted for that particular uh, so i think the end the, maybe the more general point is early on in the planning process it's critical to engage the stakeholder communities uh, in order to ensure relevance of, of these ones um, so speaking of houston uh, just you know where it is and its problems have you have your models also take into account local regional flooding events and what that can do for creating schools habitats you know where a bunch of tires in the backyard might only be dry and not in the rainwater flood and reasonable when you yeah that's a good point and that had a lot of that that Brownsville that was outbreak that I was talking about that actually was post post hurricane a uh, post hurricane outbreak um, and so it did have to do with some Filling up containers via heavy rainfall and flood events. Um, so that's definitely an issue. Um, in terms of have we addressed that, um, the answer is no. We have not looked at, at the specific flood events and, and rain radius and flood potential. We haven't really had the capability from a modeling perspective to that. We've been trying to get funding to do some work looking at, um, I don't know what you would call this, cascading. Um, kind of cascading disasters or multiple multiple hazards. So looking at, for example, the interface of extreme heat, water, uh, flooding, fire, um, extreme heat, those types of things. So, for example, in Colorado, one of the problems we had some, some really severe wild wildfires uh, a few years back, um, and they were in areas where people lived, so they had to get fire so it has burned out entire mountains um, up behind the communities. Again, we got hit with a very large flood in 2013. Um, 
the harder surgery is that where your anatomy requires because the host folks have no capacity to get the water. So that's kind of a cascading. It's like I guess the point is one of our areas of interest is kind of looking for at these cascading um, types of disasters that you can get. Um, Um, you mean by the, do they kill, do they kill the disease? Do they weaken them or make them less fit? Because I find it interesting that maybe it's more of an issue that people are constantly exposed and that's their only source and so they can constantly get exposed and so otherwise it would be uh, less ideal for them to also have water. I, you know, I probably haven't worked enough with that kind of biological level to understand. I think what little I do know, I would imagine the fitness of the mosquito would be impacted by the develop by incubating a virus just because it requires energy to do that. Um, beyond that level, I don't think I could answer the question. I've read a few studies about how incubating doesn't impact the immunity so much as the nature of the Mosquito populations impacted by the severe weather and other health hazards. Um, you know, the particular mosquito that I'm talking about has habitat syndrome in Oklahoma. Um, another so that seems to take it from us, but I don't know that these mosquitoes existed in Oklahoma in the UK when they were building it. But it looked like there were a couple of counties where they reported it. And I like to say, in this particular mosquito compared to other pests, it's not. Um, very abundant in, um, in Oklahoma or something like that. Um, I don't think that um, mosquitoes would be any more likely to be in Oklahoma or areas of Oklahoma compared to other areas. Um, I think it would depend on the species, but I think one interesting aspect of the mosquitoes is that um, it depends on the species you're looking at to try to figure out which one you want. So if you like mosquitoes are good example. Like mosquitoes, um, of which are some species transmitted by spotted lice. And there are some that are more flood water mosquitoes that, that thrive in irrigated and agricultural areas. There are others that are more urban that thrive in um, you know, sewers and containers, just like in Sydney and whatnot. And so, all that to say, some of them do better when there's lots of rain or lots of water going in the field, and some of them are adversely impacted. So it, it kind of depends on what species you're looking at. You said it's it's uh, it's not really monitored. Uh, mosquito populations aren't necessarily monitored nationwide in terms of like you said, like the mountains and isolating peripheral hotspots like the ones in Colorado or even the particular salt lake area. How is that a is that a gap that needs to be filled as to like a peripheral wide Yeah, yeah. I um, that paper that I showed the map from, we were kind of arguing <laughs> using that map is to to and the kind of the results that we had to demonstrate the uncertainty about uh, as to where this mosquito is. So you know, just kind of where we've observed it and then where we know it's suitable for it. We don't know, um, but we have so much so big of a gap in our knowledge. We don't know um, exactly where it is. So we were kind of arguing. 
that there needs to probably be a federal level effort or at least a federally coordinated effort to set up some standardized areas where these mosquitoes could be um, surveilled and not just kind of the the one-off once, you know, if I found it or not, but actual seasonal surveillance or week, weekly or monthly surveillance that could tell us a little bit about disease transmission risk throughout the year and how it varies. Um, but because of the disparities that there are between cities and counties, um, I think it would be difficult to kind of cobble something together that would be funded at the municipality or at the state level. So it almost, in my view, would have to be kind of a federal effort that would have a fairly big payoff um, your question also has some interesting implications. A question that I frequently get um, from kind of me particularly media outlets is, is climate change causing the increased risk? Is climate change causing this? Uh, we cannot answer that question because we do not have any baseline information about the historical range of this mosquito or the viruses that it transmits in order to say this is where it was and this is where it is now and then to kind of you know, do the science to look at why it moved. We just don't have that baseline information. So a surveillance capability would also allow us to establish a baseline from which we can measure kind of how things are changing and engage future risk beyond that. So there's a number of different issues created by the lack of surveillance. And I think probably the cost benefit of, of implementing some more widespread surveillance would be huge in terms of understanding harms.